can't quite believe I'm in this particular place. Uh, it's a fantastic <laughs> lecture room. Um, I first came to Cambridge and the CCDC building years ago. I, for some reason, there was an event taking place. I got the train up from Sussex where I was a graduate student. And I was pacing up and down the Union Road because I was too scared to walk into the building. <laughs> it looked so intimidating and tempting at the same time. And I couldn't decide. I almost went back on the train again afterwards. But as I was standing there, this, this gentleman with a nice looking beard, he opened the door for me, he happened to be Frank Allen, he introduced himself and brought me upstairs. First person I see in the room upstairs was this gentleman here, Joel Bernstein. He doesn't remember it, but this was one of the, the events of my academic life to that point. And we've been friends and collaborators, and he's been a fantastic mentor ever since. So I am thrilled, privileged, and fantastically honored to be here. Um, there is an abstract in that handout, forget about that. that that was just something I threw in because Pete Wood was nagging me and nagging me and <laughs> nagging me. And the same is true for the title. There's not going to be a crystal ball. There's not going to be anything like that. It's, frankly, I don't know where this talk is going. If you, if you attended the dinner yesterday, you know precisely what to expect and what not to expect. Um, I made the mistake of asking Colin recently what he was going to talk about. Don't ever do that if you're going to give a talk before him or after him, because we've had a lot of talks already. So we've had a, basically a who's who of structural chemistry, and a lot of material has really been covered fantastically well up to this point. And I, like I said, I asked Colin, saying, so Colin, what are you going to talk about? Thinking, ah, oh, this and that. And he showed me 50 slides. And apparently Colin is going to cover all of that. <laughs> which doesn't leave me with an awful lot. So this, apparently, is my bit. Now, Colin also, late last night, told me that the only, the only reason I'm in this session is to make his talk look great. <laughs> and you kind of appreciate that kind of honesty for, from the executive director. And I think I'm going to hit that mark quite, quite well. Um, now, throughout this presentation, I'm going to litter I'm going to throw in a few quotes here and there that I've heard through the meeting. I apologize beforehand if I quote you incorrectly. I apologize if I quote you at all. And I also apologize if I don't quote you. I mean, I couldn't fit everyone in. But there's going to be the odd bit here and there. Now, given the fact that this is my part, uh, the outline of the talk looks a bit like this. Yeah, uh, so I, essentially I have, I have four parts. So the first part is going to be an introduction which is largely unrelated to the rest of the presentation. <laughs> and the second part is going to be some sort of ill-advised analogy to try to illustrate some scientific points. Third, I'm going to go on for too long about something. <laughs> and then fourth, Susanna is going to kick me off the stage. So that is, that is basically what we can look forward to for the next half an hour or so, or however long I have. Uh, speaking of Susanna, though, I had one slide prepared when I arrived in Cambridge. One slide. And Susanna showed the same damn slide in her presentation. So this is what she showed to give us a historical context. So I could have taken it out, but I decided to keep it in, because she didn't do her homework terribly well. Because she showed two movie posters, one from 1965, and you can't change the fact. This was the blockbuster in 1965. And she showed some other movie poster of what is the current blockbuster. But that was two years ago, or two days ago. And as you all know, in two days, thousands of new data points can be added. And this is no longer the hobby. This is Jurassic World. It's the current blockbuster. Okay? So it makes you wonder a little bit what people were thinking in 1965 in terms of wanting to escape from the reality and what we think now. Apparently, none of us liked the present. But Susanna didn't quite look deeply enough into the movie world in 1965, because the second biggest movie in 1965 was something that looked like this. <laughs> what is it with us and dinosaurs? Um, so it seems like nothing has changed in terms of our cultural taste, at least. However, 
when it comes to information, and this is going to be the main focus of the talk, the, in terms of how much information we have, we have way more now than we did 50 years ago. There is no doubt about that. And it makes you wonder a little bit, I mean, how much do we actually need? I mean, when is it going to stop? Let's see, if we ask people in 1990, when we were sort of approaching 100,000 structures in the database, we were thinking maybe, wow, that's a huge number. I mean, is this it now? Is, gonna, is it going to plateau out? Or can we, can we answer all the questions now? Or can we solve all the problems? Or what do we do at this point? Are we, I mean, obviously waiting for the millionth structure, and then are we going to have answers then that we don't have now? Uh, it, comes, it comes a point in time, I think, then, when we have too much information, basically. So this is a social science curve of some sort. So basically, this will relate the decision-making quality to the amount of information that you have available to you. Now, the CSD is helping us tremendously here. Because if we had 780,000 data points sporadically spread out, we would be sitting here right now. We would consider that to be complete information overload, and our decision-making quality would be way down. Now, the fact that we have the CSD to organize that information, to curate it, to sort it out for us, means that I think we're still sitting around here. Without the CSD, this information wouldn't make any sense to us at all. But having access to the database itself and all the added features that the CCDC have provided for us I think there is plenty of room for scope here. So I'm guessing that we are probably somewhere in that region. Um, and basically, the whole thing, of course, starts with a molecule somewhere. So now I'm going to try to walk through a little bit how we get this information and what we might be able to do with that information eventually if we can analyze it correctly and in an efficient way. So this is something from my lab, and, and the first thing that we would do when we want to look at the crystal is to try to solve the structure of that particular compound. And to some extent, this could be thought of as regular analytical chemistry. Because quite often, I'm a synthetic chemist, <laughs> I'm not a crystallographer, I'm a synthetic chemist, so we look at this and we might know a couple of things. We might like to know what the chemical components in that crystal are. Uh, we might know, want to know something about the stoichiometry. We might want to know the shape of the individual building blocks. Maybe the relative orientation of building blocks with respect to each other. Um, as part of this whole exercise, we get all sorts of other information. Now. We get density. We might get some information about char chirality. There's all sorts of good information that comes out of one determination of a single, single crystal. <coughs> And this, to some extent, is analytical chemistry. We can stop there and move to something else. Um, the unique thing about crystallography and crystal structures is that anybody can really assess the quality of that single data point without actually having access to the material itself. It's really, really difficult to do that with any other technique. And I, I can't really think of anything else that we could do that with, because it would be great in many ways if we had properties associated with every data point, if we had an NMR spectrum associated with every data point. But we can never, or we cannot, certainly at this point, we cannot curate that information to the same level of accuracy and quality that we can for crystallographic information. So if you look at an NMR spectrum, there might be impurities here. We don't, know, we don't know exactly what happened to this sample, whereas without having access to the sample itself, we can figure out if this crystal structure determination is good, bad, or should be discarded. That's a huge advantage and makes crystallography and crystal structure data unique in the scientific community, I think. Um, and these are the two things that I picked up, or I picked up many things from Olga's presentation. I had goosebumps all the way through, that was one thing. But she said two things. And the CSD is essentially built on accuracy of data, something that we cannot, as I said, curate in uniformly in any other experimental technique, I don't think. And this is also really important. It's a communication with authors, because every time you send something in to the CSD, 
you become a little bit invested in that whole process. You become, can I say, part owner of that whole enormous treasure trove of information. And suddenly you begin to care much more than you normally would about sending stuff somewhere else because you have added to that body of work. And I think this was a very clever way of getting a community to become devoted and keen to maintain this relationship with this organization and wanting all of us to try to add more and more to the CSD. I think those two absolutely outstanding features in this whole process. Now, so this is the starting point. So this is just analytical chemistry if you look at one crystal and one data point. You get information out and you learn something from it. But if you want to use that information and move forward to use that information to predict or extrapolate, you need more data, you need more information. And from that point of view, you really need more structures. Without more structures, more structures that are related to each other of the same quality, we are not going to be able to find patterns of behavior. And that is really what we're looking for. There is little point in trying to draw too many conclusions about a single crystal structure. That could be dangerous, could be misleading, it could be correct, but we need a lot of data, we need a lot of information to identify patterns of behavior. So that's what the CSD has allowed us to do. Okay, so I'm going to switch now to the second part of my presentation, which gets a little bit risky. But in order to get this information, we need systematic data. We need all sorts of information, and this is the only way that we can begin to test and formulate hypotheses. But sometimes we're going to need help with this. First of all, we're going to need enough information to be able to make a correct decision. There's no question about that. We don't know yet exactly how much we need, but we need enough. I don't know what the number is, but we need enough. Secondly, even though we have a lot of information and we can look at it, Sometimes we're going to need help to try to interpret and decipher what that information is telling us. And this is where the CCDC edition of software is actually coming into play. I'm going to try to illustrate my point here with something, uh, something like an analogy. Now, I picked this up from Martin's talk as well, and he said, analogies are useful. I'm going to really try to put that to the test now. And if you don't, mar if you don't like what you see next, blame Martin Stahl. <laughs> okay. I don't know if he's here still, but... If not, it's his fault, okay? So I'm gonna show two pictures. Now, I beg of you, think of these two pictures as two crystal structures, okay? So here's the first one. So this is one data point. So let's think of this as a crystal structure. I have to apologize to our Italian friends if they're still around, but this is just happens to be uh, Silvio Berlusconi. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who it is, okay? So this can reflect one data point, a crystal structure determination. So we know basically the composition of this structure. We, knew, we know who's in here, and we know the position, the shape, the orientation of these building blocks with respect to each other. At this point, however, I think it would be dangerous to draw any kind of conclusion about the general behavior of this particular building block. <laughs> no, no, no. We only have one data point. Okay? And I think it would be even more dangerous to try to draw conclusions about the general behavior of any molecule with the same kind of chromosome distribution. <laughs> okay? That would be totally unfair. So we need more information, we need more data. So we solve a second crystal structure. <laughs> Hold on. You jump into conclusions, and that is highly unscientific. This is another data point. The only thing we can tell from this picture is that we have a certain number of molecules in there. They have certain shapes. They have certain I don't know, torsion angles, distances from each other. Um, and now we're gathering information so we might be able to see or say something about the general behavior of the building blocks in this particular sequence of, of data points. But this is still hard. This is still difficult. So we need some help, maybe, to really interpret correctly what is going on here. I know some of you are thinking you shouldn't. It's very unscientific. So we go to the, uh, the next page here, and this is something that Helen Berman said early on, 
and she'll be horrified to know she's associated with this, but she said something like this. You can't just put data out there. You have to manage it. And I think this is really important. So a lot of people put data out there, and that's it. But you have to curate it. You have to make sure that it has quality. And I think you have to make sure that it has meaning. So you're trying to think in your own minds now. What, is, what, can, what kind of conclusions can I draw from this? And we're going to go to the CCDC and we'll ask them for some help. And they come up with two brilliant programs. We have Isostar, we have Mercury, we have Gold, we have all sorts of things that will help us to really break down what is going on here. And you'll be surprised. It's not what you think. Because if you analyze this really, really clearly, the angle of the head tilted, the direction of the eye focus is actually right here. And the same is true over here. <laughs> you disappoint me. This is really what is going on. So this person here has a, has a very strong interest in furniture. <laughs> Which, if, if you really think about it, and this is a little bit cheesy, but if you really think about it, throughout his political life, he's been building cabinets. <laughs> right? You need the background. Oh. You need the background. You need the background. So this, this is his interest. So don't jump to conclusions. And this is what I mean when you have to really focus closely on the information. You might need some help now and again to interpret it correctly. This is what we get in the CSD. This is what the CCDC is adding in terms of value and information to that body of research. So we are getting to this point now, patterns of behavior. Once we get to that, we can begin now to do some synthesis. And as I said, I'm a synthetic chemist. I'd like to be able to extrapolate from this pattern of behavior to a point where I can make new things. That's what I would like to do. So from a single molecule, a single crystal, one data point, many data points, patterns of behavior, extrapolate, generalize, make hypotheses, te test hypotheses, and that might get us to this point of synthesis. And I think this kind of summarizes what we can say confidently about the CSD. No one else has this. No other scientific community has access to this kind of collection of data with the same kind of quality, usability, despite what some of us think sometimes, it is very, very easy to use. Let's face it, that is, that is a fact, I think. Each individual data point in that treasure trove can be assessed for quality. That is an unbelievable advantage over any other database. Uh, this should be the benchmark. Good luck to all the other guys trying to reach something even remotely closely to what the CSD is able to produce. And of course, in order to be effective, it doesn't have to run on a remote computer somewhere. So now we can, just, we can have it on our phone, we can have it on our little laptop or whatever. So to, in order to be effective, this database has to be convenient, accessible, and immediate. And I spoke to Roger Davey last night about this, and he gave me a really good illustration. So he said, he tried to summarize what this meant, is, and he said something like, you need to live near to the shops. <laughs> At that point, I didn't know what he meant, but what he meant was that in order to not to starve, scientifically, you have to be close to these kind of resources, and that's what the CCDC has provided. Now we have access to this anywhere we go, anytime we want, and that's a big, big deal. So thank you for that, Roger. It really, really brought that home to me. Um, Things change. Things have changed over the last 50 years, and I'm sure things are going to continue to change. And there is a sort of a general idea of disrupting technology. So you have some sort of industry, and then some other technology comes along, and suddenly you don't have a comp company anymore. So some of us might remember the Sony Walkman. It was great. We had magnetic tapes. They were fantastic. What happened to Betamax, VHS? Those all disappeared due to emerging, disrupting technologies. Now, the question is, potentially the CSD could be under threat as well from disrupting technologies, but I'm not really sure about that. So let's say what happens in the next 50 years. Sally and her crew, will, and Aurora and many others, will suddenly be able to accurately predict every crystal structure unambiguously. 
Uh, we can get routine information directly from powder data, or we can use some fancy flash laser X-ray tool on tiny, tiny samples, and we can get the crystal structure in, I don't know, one minute. Even if that happens, even if all of those four things happen, the CSD is going to persist, because that information still has to be organized, curated, made accessible. So it doesn't really matter as long as each data point has the quality that we require. To some extent, it doesn't really matter if the structure is solved in a computer, or on a diffractometer, or in some other way. But the CSD, I think, is not going to be disrupted by those kind of potentially threatening technologies. So I'm going to give you a very, very small, simple case study where we've tried to use the CSD and some of the tools from the CCDC as well in a, in a little research project that we just got published two days ago, in fact. So I'm, I'm very happy to talk about it. So this is a case of improving energetic materials. So this is the reason why I started chemistry in the first place. So basically, you blow things up, <laughs> right? So energetic materials come in all different flavors and all different varieties, and they have many, many advantages. So here are some advantages of energetic materials. Mining and uh, deconstruction of buildings and all sorts of useful, useful things that you can achieve with energetic materials. So these are advantages. Now, these advantages are really rather similar. So the advantages and the disadvantages of energetic materials are frequently closely overlapping. And there is obviously a almost a contradiction here, because the more power you potentially can get out of an energetic material frequently, the more hazardous the handling, storage, and transportation is of that particular material. So in our lab, we, got the, uh, we were charged with the, with the responsibility, or we were given this task to try to find ways of minimizing chemical reactivity of an explosive, minimizing the sensitivity of an explosive. And of course, we jumped at this opportunity because we're chemists, right? Uh, so let's see. This is the little molecule. Or this is the starting point, then. So if, any, if some of you might know something about energetic materials, then energe energetic materials is typically the chemistry of this group over here. It's a nitro group. Normally, the more nitro groups you have present, the more bangs for bucks you can expect to get out. So we have nitro groups, we have nitro groups, and this is a relatively well-known explosive. It's, we abbreviate it to be EDNA. It's, it has reasonably, it's reasonably insensitive, so it's not too bad. So it's typically used as a secondary explosive, and you typically need a, a primary component that is very sensitive to, get, to set this off. But there are some problems with a molecule like this, and the problems come around partly from the presence of these nitro groups, which make some of these bonds very irritable, and partly due to the presence of this guy here. So this proton over here, I know that many of you are not chemists, but this proton over here is very acidic, due to the fact that we have a nitro group here, and this is also a very acidic proton due to the nitro group here. So this is essentially an acid, in many ways. Now, if you try to store an acid in the presence of metals, then they can easily react and form metal salts. And these metal salts of an energetic materials can be extraordinarily hazardous. Many primary explosives are metal salts, and if something happens during storage, transportation, and you don't know when or how it's going to happen, then you might have a real problem on your hand. So what we would like to do here is two things. We wanted to try to minimize the chemical reactivity of this compound, essentially trying to limit the acidity of this species without changing the molecule itself. And we also wanted to try to minimize or decrease the impact sensitivity somehow by adding buffers, small molecules, between these molecules, so we can maybe dissipate the energy that these would release, or we might find ways of making these bonds somewhat less sensitive. So where do you start them? Well, if you know something about the CSD, there's got to be something in there that we can actually use. And I'm going to first show you my synthetic strategy. Sometimes, again, for those who are not chemists, if you go to a talk in 
various areas of organic chemistry or natural product synthesis, you will see someone put up a slide. There are 50 steps. And the talk will consist of someone walking through 50 steps. And at the end, you have one milligram of something. Something that comes out of the back of a beetle. I don't know. So this is my only synthetic, synthetic scheme. So we're going to take our explosive material, and we're going to combine it in solution with something that is not explosive. And we're going to make this. It looks very, very trivial. So this is a co-crystal. And Chick was talking about co-crystals early on, so you know all about that by now. And basically, what this is hopefully going to do for us is it's going to minimize the chemical reactivity. And it's going to minimize the impact sensitivity without completely destroying the ability of this material to deliver some bang. All right, so where do we start then? So we're going to target the acidic proton, those NH groups, and we're going to try to see if we can find ways of breaking up the crystal lattice of this molecule by itself. So we go to the database, and it's kind of disappointing that this wasn't done in 1965. It was done in 1968. It's still a long time ago. But this was curated. So we know this is a highly reliable structure. We can trust the information in the CSD because they have always exercised a high level of quality control. And you need high level of quality control when you're dealing with explosives. So we looked at this material. And this is the crystal structure. And I don't know if you can see. So basically, and I'm too bad Angelo isn't here, but these are dotted lines. And they, therefore, has, they have to be chemical bonds, right? That is the universal description. There's a dotted line here that has to be some interaction, or is it contact, or there is something. They're close together. Uh, in this particular crystal structure, then, we have a whole series of NHO short contacts. We need to break that somehow in order for this molecule to form a co-crystal with something else. So we go to the database, and then we look at isostar, and we can get all these pretty pictures, but there is actually a lot of information within these pretty pictures. And consequently, we can figure out what is the best potential partner for our NH groups that is going to replace the nitro group as an acceptor in that particular interaction. So we're going to try to sneak in an interloper. We're going to break up that relationship. And uh, through that particular investigation, we find a series of molecules. It doesn't really matter what they are. They all have something in common. And that is a very good hydrogen bond acceptor. So we have lone pairs here. We have lone pairs here. And these are really simple molecules. All of them, in principle, based upon what we've seen in Isostar, should be capable of replacing the nitro group as an acceptor of that NH hydrogen bond. So the outcome of the synthesis now is going to be described in three quick structures. So this is the first crystal structure. Here is our eDNA molecule. And as you can see, we've made a co-crystal because this now has two components. It is the molecule itself. And here is a sort of bipyridine or bipyridine type species. So we have an NH, N hydrogen bond over here, one here, one here. And this will make an infinite chain. If we replace this with a slightly different molecule, still with two acceptors at either side, nothing much really changes. And this is great. We want structural predictability. We want some reason of controlling the way that these assemblies come together. And if we change from a nitrogen as an acceptor to an oxygen as an acceptor, really, there is little difference in the way that these chains are assembled together. And that will offer some structural control and structural control is largely essential if we want to try to begin to predict properties based upon the structure itself. So the acidic protons, they offer that synthetic avenue because they provide now a different type of hydrogen bond, allowing us to make a co-crystal. And the question is now, how does this affect the physical properties? How do we measure impact sensitivity? How do we find out if something is suddenly more sensitive or less sensitive to impact? Well, you drop things on the sample, right? I'm sorry, I woke a few people up there. But, um, and this is our little device for testing impact sensitivity. So this is state of the art. We built this in the workshop. So down here, we have a metal plate. And then we have a plastic tube. And at the bottom here, we're going to place one or two milligrams of our explosive. We're going to have a metal chunk, and we're going to drop it down, and we're going to see if 
we get an explosion or not. And then we can come up with an E or H50 value. And the H50 val value will tell us that this is the height from which 50% of drops will lead to an explosion. So the H50 value for eDNA itself is 100 centimeters, which means that if you drop a weight from 100 centimeters onto the sample, every other time you will get an explosion. So the bigger or higher the distance, the less impact sensitive the material is. So one of our co-crystals then will show this kind of impact sensitivity, which means that we have now reduced the sensitivity, so it's less likely to go off accidentally. So it's just a quick, quick illustration. Now, something else that we're interested in is density, because the more dense the material is, the more, typically, the more power you have per weight unit. And here, oops, here is the density of eDNA by itself, and here's the density of one of the co-crystals of eDNA. So we've actually increased the density, and this has a lot of bangs for bucks as well. So we have reduced impact sensitivity, we have improved density, and we haven't lost too much in terms of explosive power. It's not as volatile as eDNA itself, but sometimes you have to compromise as well. I'm going to skip that one. The one thing that we really wanted to do was to change the chemical stability. So we want to make sure that we don't corrode a metal if you store it, let's say, in a metal casing or somewhere else. So it's a little bit difficult to see, but we just have a copper strip, so this is not particularly qualitative, it's just quantitative. So we sprinkle a little, we sprinkle a little bit of explosive material on a copper strip. I have five fingers. So we sprinkle a little bit material on a copper strip, and then we sprinkle a little bit of the a coke crystal of the same material on a copper strip, and then we wait for 20 hours. And you can see how this is clearly corrosion. So you see the green color here. We are making a metal salt or copper. In this case, this can sit around for a long, 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 long time. So we've reduced the acidity. We have reduced the chemical reactivity. And from that perspective, we've really made this material much safer when it comes to storage, handling, and transportation. And if you really want to release eDNA afterwards, it's easy to extract this in a pure form. So that's, that's fine. So this is just one illustration of what we can do with information or synthesis based on the CSD and the add-on values of the programs that the CCDC have, has provided for us. And I think this is just to thank the people who did this work. This is John. He's our crystallographer. Taranga is my current star pupil. She makes all the materials and she does all the stuff. And she's just one of the best students I've ever had in the lab. And this just came out, like I said, two days ago in Chemistry European Journal. Anyway, I'm going to finish off pretty soon, I think, because Susanna is beginning to look at me quite fiercely. Um, so just a quick look at the future then. And I think the future of structural science or chemical crystallography or crystal, single crystal diffraction is not going to be defined by single crystal X-ray diffraction anymore. I don't think that is the sole focus at all. We are going to be moving further and further away in the grand scheme of things from atoms and molecules, I think, to areas where we really actively have to organize and manipulate molecules and ions in really pretty complicated and complex systems. And the outlook is always going to be now to synthesize and build and maybe engineer new materials. Materials can be in a biological context. It can be a traditional context when it comes to materials chemistry. But I think this is definitely what we need to think about. And structural science is going to be at the forefront. Of not every discipline, but very, very many disciplines and all the problems and grand challenges that we have in front of ourselves. And this is going to cover everything from biology to the futuristic or future world, whatever that looks like in 50 years time. Um, structural science is going to be absolutely critical to solving the problems that we're facing right now, whether it's energy, whether it's fresh water, whether it's food, or anything of that nature. Yeah, I was going to say something about this. What was it? No, can I? You were so 
kind to me last night when you were all standing up and sitting down and standing up and sitting down. I'm going to try something else right now. <laughs> Can I just ask you, just for two seconds, to glance around this room and just see, look at a few faces in this audience. Sitting up there, it's easy. You just look across, look across, look across. And you see a bunch of people here. There might be 140, 150 people here. You can categorize everyone you see into one of three groups. The first group is people that you know. You know their names, they're friends of yours. The second group is people that you think you've met at some point, <laughs> and you talk to them over coffee, and you try really hard not to look at their name tag while keeping <laughs> eye contact and keeping that conversation going. And the third group is people that you've never met before. The really cool part, I think, is that all of those people, every single one of those people, have been working on the same project. All of us have worked on one project, whether we knew it or not. And we are just a little part of this. There are 300,000 other authors out there also working on the same project. Can you imagine 300,000 authors doing one thing and doing one thing really well? Different backgrounds, different skill level, different ages different gender. There's, there's data in here from Cambridge to Cape Town, from Kansas to Kinshasa, from postcode to ref code. <laughs> All goes into the CSD in an extraordinarily focused, useful, and unbelievably helpful way to science. Now, it's good manners if you have a question in the title to provide an answer. And I'm going to hand over to Colin soon, and he will give you the answer. <laughs> I'm just going to give you the big picture. So this is the big picture. With the help of that information, there are some huge challenges when it comes to energy, when it comes to fresh water, when it comes to uh, health, life, death, all of that, the CSD is going to be at the interface. The CSD is going to be there to try to solve many, many, many of those problems. So this is the, the big overview. Now, Colin is going to tell us exactly how this is going to happen. But meanwhile, I'd just like to thank you for your attention. And it's been a fantastic meeting. I'm so glad you could all come. All the best for the next 50 years. Thank you.